Hey, thanks for tuning in. We have Alan Anand, who is uh, one of the leading Vedic astrologers uh, in the world today. And uh, he's one of the foremost researchers and has presented uh, many conferences. And I think his, uh, your latest is uh, the Kepler conference in which you are very active in terms of doing new research and stuff. So thanks for joining me, Alan. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you. Uh, thank you, Ashwin, for having me on it too. So uh, you are one of the most, uh, I, I think as we already spoke in the uh, pre-session, like you are probably the uh, only person who has written a book, entire book on Parivartan Yoga. So uh, I think it is important uh, for, not just for me to kind of expose those, uh, the important knowledge that you have regarding Parivartan Yoga, which always remains to be a blind side for many astrologers. Uh, astrologers think and uh, they tend to have a prefixed notion that they know what is Parivartan Yoga, they know how Parivartan Yoga works. But that's the, the manifestation and the results, how we see in terms of uh, while analyzing a particular chart is not even close to uh, what we have in our mind. So I just thought it, it would be great to have your views and your uh, expert ideas in terms of how Parivartan Yogas work and uh, how we can use it in practice. Especially, I think we, uh, I really want to talk about the Vipari Raja Yoga that, that gets formed uh, through Parivartan Yoga. So, uh, but I think that we will get back to that uh, during the later part of this session. But... Uh, yeah, how did you kind of start your book and what was the basic motivation for you to write a book on Parivartana Yoga? Uh, later, later on, we'll just get into the concept of Parivartana Yoga and stuff. Okay, so to go back to its genesis, uh, many years ago when I was uh, seeking to be qualified by uh, ACVA, the uh, American College of Vedic Astrology, uh, back in that era, they uh, allowed you to do one of two things for your uh, uh, final uh, level of certification. You could do a, a detailed analysis of uh, 10 charts, uh, you know, writing two or three or four pages on each one of uh, those charts, or you could write a uh, 10,000 word thesis. Well, because I'm a writer, you know, writing things comes easily to me and 10,000 words didn't sound like very much. So I thought about it a bit and, uh, you know, Parivartana Yoga was something that kind of interested me because I kind of crunched the numbers on it and I, I had determined that roughly 43% of, of mankind has a Parivartana Yoga in their chart. So knowing it's one of the most common yogas and, you know, I've at one time or another published published a graph showing this, it's far more common than any of the Raja Yogas, Dhani Yogas, or many of the other common yogas that we use all the time. So knowing it was very common, I thought it would be of interest, and um, I thought it would be a good exercise for me to do. So I ended up writing this thesis for ACFA, which I blew right by my 10,000 word count very easily. And next thing I know, I had 25,000, 30,000 words, I guess, submitted it as my thesis and you know, got my certification. Well, actually, years went by and I, I didn't do anything with it. But um, uh, at one point, um, you know, I was in close contact with uh, Hart Defoe's uh, guru, um, Mantraji, here in Toronto. And he always used to say to me, I used to ask him sometimes, you know, is it... Uh, uh, write conduct, or is it a noble profession to to write fiction, to write novels? He kind of roll his, roll his eyes a little bit. He said, "Well, it's a creative act, and you know it's good in that respect." But he said, "You should be writing astrology books." And I said to him, "Mantraji, I'd love to, but I don't feel like there's anything new to say. I don't have anything original to say. What could I do?" And he said, "Well, you think about it. You will come up with something." And he said, "Once you start, you." you will not finish. <laughs> and so that was kind of funny. Uh, anyway, so I thought back, wow, I have, I'm sitting on this thesis, uh, and uh, maybe I should look at that and expand it. So I went to work on it, and um, yeah, I expanded it. It went from 30,000 words to whatever, 85,000 words or something like that. Did a lot more research and turned it into a full-blown book which, you know, serves the need for Vedic astrologers because, you know, I spent a lot of time on 
um, Facebook typically and the uh, the Jyotish groups. And I'm always I was always surprised to find that many people really didn't seem to have a very good idea of uh, Parivartana Yoga's interpretation. And so I thought, well, you know, this is coming at the right time. This will help people, uh, you know, in their effort to uh, uh, understand this yoga and, and interpret it for the sake of their friends, associates, or clients as well. So I, I hope it's serving that need. Um, many times, one of the common mistakes that people make, I think, in looking at Parivartana Yoga is, you know, let's say if it's uh, Jupiter or Saturn, they say, well, you know, uh, Saturn owns two uh, signs, two houses. Jupiter owns two signs and two houses. Uh, which ones do I, you know, involve in the interpretation? That sort of blew my mind that people were confused about this very simple concept. You don't look at all four houses. You only look at the two houses that those two planets occupy and rule at the same time. And that's your focus, uh, just two houses. And then if you know your house associations, and anybody can you know, read up on this and memorize the stuff, uh, and then you just start to play this kind of game in your mind. What if um, you know, the Lord of the sixth was in the tenth while the Lord of the tenth was in the sixth? What would it do for either one of those houses? And you play kind of word association with, uh, uh, with yourself and you come up with an interpretation. And well, you know, people don't even have to do that anymore now because I spent, I did all the heavy lifting uh, and sat down with, you know, house associations and the nature of the planets themselves, of course, and worked all this out so that for every uh, combination, there's at least, uh, you know, uh, seven to 10 different points of um, interpretation that you can apply. You know, sometimes they're health related, sometimes they're about the people in your lives. Sometimes there may be a spiritual context and so on and so forth. So it's a lot of information there. Okay, so I think that's one of the most interesting beginnings that we could have had for this session. Uh, you mentioned about how people confuse the lordships or the other houses those two planets own but it is all about the planets that uh, it is all about the houses that in which those two planets are placed so the occupation the, yeah the occupation so uh, this is uh, i think this th this is a misnomer that uh, i mean the considering the other lordships i think this is a misnomer that has developed over a period of time and this must not have been the case. So, uh, if you see whatever you say is uh, is largely uh, the understanding of the medieval astrologers in of the Islamic tradition, and later on we find the same in uh, the works of William Lilly as well. So, I think mutual reception has been uh, uh, it has been given in a much more uh, concise and uh, clear manner in those traditions than the modern. Uh, Vedic astrologers have done or dealt with it. So, which which is why your book kind of stands out in the market in terms of uh, uh, like being a, b being one of the most important books uh, in Vedic astrology itself. So, yeah, uh, and the other coming back to your book, your book is uh, it kind of sets the tone straight away in terms of if you look at the. Uh, index like uh, uh, you were pretty much clear in terms of how you were going to deal with the book. Uh, you you gave three bifurcations of Parivartana Yoga as Maha Parivartana Yoga, Kala Parivartana Yoga, and Dainya Parivartana Yoga. So from there you start and then you go on with um, benefits and malefics and other basic stuff that involves uh, Parivartana Yoga, and and then you directly move on to the house lords. So uh, it's it's like uh, you continue with first lord, first house lord involved in a parivartana, or second house lord involved in a parivartana, and so on. So right. so uh, I think no one has ever uh, clearly done this work. So and getting back to one of the most important things you mentioned, uh, avastas in the appendix. So uh, how how crucial are avastas in terms of? determining Parivartana Yogas because when we uh, when we talk about Vedic astrology we are basically using most of the Vedic astrologers use whole sign houses uh, and uh, we take one sign as a 
whole thing and uh, right. degrees don't really matter especially in uh, indian practice uh, i don't see astrologers using degrees in a larger way maybe the uh, upcoming astrologers of current era use degrees but uh, indian astrologers uh, tend to begin with nadi astrology and we don't care about the degrees when you talk about nadi astrology and it's basically about the geometrical and astronomical relationships of the uh, of the planets and their placements so but when it comes to actual analysis do you think degrees really matter because we are using whole sign houses i'm sure uh, i think i have had a notion that degrees matter whenever a planet is applying to a perfect reception or an aspect with another planet i think it the intensity of the functioning of that particular pair of planets that are involved in mutual reception will be much more than uh, usual stuff where when planets are not closely related in terms of degrees do you agree with that well uh, degrees do matter um, uh, just before i talk about uh, that within the context of uh, parivartana yoga just consider this you could have two planets in a sign and if they are separated by 3 or 4 or 5 degrees or whatever you know we simply say that they are associated but if those two planets are within less than 1 degree of longitude apart from each other and if they are the the true planets uh, mars mercury jupiter uh, venus or saturn you then have a situation of what is called graha yuda planetary war and then that's a problem for one or the other of those planets and specifically for the departments of life that they rule whether it's a person in your life or some area of activity or whatever so the degrees do matter in that context but uh in the context of parivartana yoga yeah degrees matter as well too um because there are, there are two basic notions with uh, parivartana yoga the basic notion the basic concept is that in your you look at a chart you see uh you know uh, one planet in the 6th and the other in the 10th but they are in each other's signs so that's where they are in reality in a snapshot of of the skies but in your mind's eye you know in your imagination you can basically swap exchange those two planets and i mean parivartana does you know if you take the word apart it means to and fro back and forth barter trade swap exchange so that's why it's called parivartana yoga because it's a they consider kind of a a movable yoga in that respect so in your mind's eye you you uh, have those two planets exchange positions but let's say uh, now the two notions are that the planet can move from its original sign uh to the other sign carrying its own degree of longitude or it can move into the other sign and step directly into the footprint left by the other planet with which it is exchanging signs so if you follow me um each planet starts off with its original degree and you might say that exchange will require them each to flip over into the other sign and take the exact same degree position that the other planet held that's one notion and you can do that but you can also say i will take my planet from uh uh house 6 with its specific degree of longitude and i will transfer that degree into that other house or sign as well well what if the sun is in that other degree uh it uh, is in that very same degree in that other house that means that upon exchange you will be placing your um uh, your your movable planet into a condition of combustion combust. or conversely the original planet could have been combust but when it moves to the other sign it will not be um so you can play around with these notions and you can you know uh depending on the the context choose to do it that way or consider both and what are the ramifications of of either one of those choices i mean that sounds complicated but as you know this is the sort of thing that goes on you know in the brain of an astrologer who says well there's possibility a of looking at it like this or b looking at it like that or c looking at it from yet another angle but we do that all the time uh you know there's the udaya lagna the 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 uh, ascendant that is actually the physical horizon but we also have chandra lagna 
and we can look at the chart from that point of view, or Surya Lagna from the points of view of Moon or, or Sun being the, the ascendant. It's just another perspective that we can take. And so it is with the, uh, with the degree positions of planets in exchange. Um, it's a choice. Okay, so uh, having said this, let's say Jupiter is placed in Sagittarius, sorry, uh, Mars is placed in Sagittarius and Jupiter is placed in Aries. Would you consider, uh, would you just, how, how do you delineate this? Uh, would you ever consider that uh, like Jupiter is placed in Pi, uh, Sagittarius itself and Mars is placed in Aries itself? Would you give that kind of a delineation? Well, for the moment, let, let's put them in houses because that's where it, it gives us meaning, right? Okay. The signs are just a vehicle for sure. the exchange of the two planets, you know, mm -hmm. because Jupiter is in Mars sign while Mars is in Jupiter sign. So let's look, let's place them in, in uh, let's say, the first and the ninth. Mm -hmm. um, so right away, these these are Dharma houses. These are fire houses. Houses one and nine are associated with spirituality, as is Dharma, as is fire to a certain degree. So you might immediately go down the road of saying that this has got something to do with um, a relationship with the father, a relationship with the guru, a relationship with the Dharma, with uh, Shastra, with teaching, with the spiritual life, and so on. Now, the whole difference is if we rotate that uh, by just one sign and say that those two uh, planets are now in the second house and the tenth house, our interpretation changes entirely because now these are artha houses that are associated with money, uh, work, and uh, professional uh, career. And so now your interpretation might very well revolve around something to do with uh, job, uh, employment, uh, professional choices, uh, education, because the second house is education, as well as what comes out of the mouth. Uh, and the tenth house is the career, public status. So you might invoke things like the capacity for public speaking, an education that leads to a professional career, uh, the money that arises as a consequence of having a good education in a public profession, and, and on and on like that, depending on what houses they are in. Houses are the key thing. Signs are just a vehicle for the exchange. The houses are what you really need to know in order to uh, make an interpretation uh, regarding that exchange. Sure, I think houses add meaning and topics to uh, the, in terms of uh, helping us interpret something in a natal chart. Mm -hmm. So going on, the, the exchange between the benefics, uh, the exchange between the malefics and the exchange between one benefic and one malefic. So the exchange between benefic is uh, is probably okay. The exchange between malefic is also fine. But the trouble starts when there is an exchange between a natural benefic and a natural malefic. But if we put the lordship uh, or deal with the houses there, I think it kind of clears all the doubts and gives us a clear set of examples. But still, how do we deal with the natural benevolence or maleficence of a particular planet when they are involved uh, in a mutual exchange? Well, you know, I put that in, <laughs> I know that's in my book, and, and I knew it would come back to haunt me someday. We don't want to stress too much about the benefic versus the malefic nature of a planet. Uh, here's one reason why. If you have a Capricorn or an Aquarius send ascendant, Saturn, the prime malefic, is not a bad planet for you. Sure. It is you, right? So we have to be wary of that notion of uh, lumping planets uh, as natural benefics or natural malefics. The key thing is do they own good or bad houses? And what will be the consequence of having affected an exchange between the two of those? But in a way, you know, every exchange has some benefit because it ends up uh, in our mind's eye, it ends up transferring one of the pair, or actually both of the pair, into the houses which they actually own. The fact that, you know, I always, I, I like to come, I'm, I'm fond of analogies, and so one of the analogies I use is like, okay, let's say you and I agree to swap houses for three months. You're gonna live in my house, I'm gonna live in your house. I will presume <clears throat> that you're gonna take good care of my house because 
you know that I'm living in your house while I'm living, you know, and vice versa. We're living in each other's house. So we will take care of each other's place. So uh, there's a benefit going on there no matter what. Uh, and that's the beauty of the exchange. I wanted to go back to one other thing that you said, you know, referring to Western astrology, and you thought maybe they had a better handle on mutual reception. It's not true. Uh, in Western astrology, the whole notion of mutual reception is a bit of a mess. And most, uh, even some well-known brand name astrologers whose names I will not name, uh, will say something like, if Mercury and Saturn are in exchange in the chart, that will make the person deep and philosophical and a scientific type, or they'll be depressed because Mercury is thinking and Saturn is, is, is a downer. Well, you know, that's just not true. Um, we do not blend the meanings of those two planets like that. What is important is that what houses do they occupy? The exchange, the mutual reception between them facilitates a cooperation between those two houses. Uh, another analogy would be an international diplomacy. If you have the ambassador of India sitting down with the ambassador of Pakistan, what you get is not a merger of their two personalities. What you get is some sort of working agreement that makes both of those countries happy. The two ambassadors are just agents of a cooperative agreement. Uh, it's not about them. They're just agents to make it happen. Okay. Uh, I think that's well put. I think analogy worked much better. So, uh, in uh, uh, coming back to the Western astrology notion in terms of uh, the uh, mutual exchange, um, when it comes to the mutual exchange in Vedic astrology, uh, I think we are we are the first people to put the ruler of a particular house uh, as a functional malefic or functional malefic, and th that is entirely a very unique uh, feature that. Vedic astrology has and uh, w what I mentioned about Western astrology is that uh, I meant to say that two planets uh, just as planets uh, have much more importance in terms of speaking of mutual exchange without the houses that's what I meant but uh, uh, it's not that uh, Vedic astrology doesn't have a good amount of information in mutual exchange we, we largely concentrated on the houses stuff, as you mentioned. So uh, I think it is kind of good to bridge uh, both those things. But uh, I think you have a different uh, ideology here in terms of the, you mentioned the Saturn and uh, Mercury mutual exchange, uh, which I think uh, is an area of research for me, but maybe not for you. You have done a lot of work when it comes to Parivartana Yoga. So... Uh, yeah, apart from that, uh, uh, there are a few other things that uh, I wanted to ask you in terms of uh, Viparita Raja Yoga. Uh, do you think uh, just the mere connection of 6th and 8th Lord will really, f I mean, not connection, but mutual exchange of the 6th and 8th Lord will create an actual positive uh, Viparita Raja Yoga? Or, or the uh, just sixth and eighth, but six and eighth, or eighth and twelfth, or sixth and twelfth, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, well, there there are two di different varieties of viparita yoga. Uh, one says that the Lord of the sixth needs to move to the eighth or the twelfth, while the Lord of the eighth moves to the sixth or the twelfth, or the Lord of the twelfth moves to the sixth or the eighth. Um, just having one of those happen in the chart, like the Lord of the Sixth going to the Eighth, uh, that's not really, uh, maybe that's a Vipri to Yoga as a very minor kind. Uh, you need to have at least two of those things happening in order to call it a, a, a Vipri to Yoga. And they refer to when all three are happening, it's called a, a full mala, uh, Vipri to Yoga. But to answer, uh, and then that's one variety, it's uh, a planet. Um, a, a Trikishtana lord moving to another Trikishtana, not its own. So in other words, you can't have the lord of the sixth stay in the sixth while the eighth and the twelfth uh, exchange places. Uh, that would only be one instance. Well, that would be two, actually. Eight going to twelve and lord of uh, twelve going to eight. That would be. But uh, the lord of the sixth staying in the sixth does not count. 
Um, that's one variety, uh, the Turkish Tana lords moving to other Turkish Tanas. Uh, a second variety of Viparita Yoga is when um, the Lord of the Sixth and the Lord of the Eighth, for example, are found together in the first house with no other association of any other planet. So this is like saying, um, here's two bad guys, you know, um, a convicted murderer and, uh, you know, a hell's angel, hell's angel biker, and they want to fight each other. You say, okay, go to an empty parking lot and fight there. So long as there's nobody else in that place, then it's fine. You can fight, you can kill each other, and that'll actually be good for society. Right, so the criteria is that two Turkish, two Turkish Tana lords can go to an empty house and fight there, and that's a viparita yoga because the, the two bads cancel each other and make it good. However, if there is another planet there, that's like saying, okay, we've gone to fight, but we've gone to fight in a schoolyard where our children are playing. So when the sticks and stones and knives come out, someone else might get hurt. There will be collateral damage. And so that will ruin that type of Viparita Yoga. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Uh, was it just in the context of Parivartna Yoga, the combination of Parivartna and Viparita? No, it's, it's a combination of Parivartana and Viparita because the Parivartana gives rise to Viparita Raja Yoga. Yes, so, it can. Yeah. yeah, if you have an exchange of the sixth and uh, twelfth lords, let's yeah. say. Yeah, um, a Taylor Swift is uh, uh, the the pop star is a famous example of uh, of uh, an exchange between sixth and twelfth, and you might say, well, that promises uh, you know some degree of difficulty uh, health wise. You would think, uh, but for her, uh, when the sixth and twelfth uh, exchange you end up in your mind's eye with a very strong 12th, with a 12th Lord in its own place and the sixth Lord in its own place. That may produce an active sex life, but no marriage. Because when the sixth is activated, the sixth is the 12th from the seventh. And so it ruins relationships. And when the 12th is activated, it's you know good for bed pleasures, no matter whether that's a, a benefic or a malefic there. So, I mean, Thus far, her, her love life is irregular, let's say. She's not settled down and she's had lots of famous boyfriends. And, and that's okay because uh, that's acceptable in modern society. So that's not a judgment call. But uh, that may be, may be a viparita in, in that respect that what, apparent, what would seem to be problematic is actually working out very well for her. Okay, great. So... <laughs> Uh, I think you you kind of quickly uh, uh, rolled out all that was needed for this particular uh, episode of Parivartan Yogas, but uh, I think we'll we'll have a further more even more lengthier discussions by getting into uh, finer uh, aspects of Parivartan Yoga and and maybe we can also analyze uh, with one or two charts if. Uh, uh, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. I mean, um, uh, you know, talking about it abstractly, it can be difficult for the viewer to understand what's going on, even when we talk about something as simple as a Mars-Jupiter exchange in Aries and Sagittarius. Nothing makes it more real than having an actual chart to see in front of you. And, and an excellent example for that would be um, um, Indira Gandhi. Who, yeah. who maybe had, can I just share the screen of Indira Gandhi's chart, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. Okay. You have a North Indian version? Uh, yeah, we can we can add that. I c I could actually show you uh, the version uh, sure. uh, okay. my, myself. Uh, sure. Uh, can you see this? Can uh, you see my screen? No. No. Okay, I don't know uh, what I need to do in order to share my screen. I've forgotten what to do. Um, okay, you you have a you have a green button in the middle, down. Uh, yes. Okay. Screen share. Okay, I click that and then I go back to the screen I want to show you. Uh, you just click the share. You click the green button there, 
and then you click the blue button in the dialog box which shows us share yeah okay i've got that and then i want then i want this one here to share uh whoops okay can you see that uh yeah it's yeah it's there uh okay can you see it better now yeah it's good okay so this is indira gandhi and uh and i've listed the three um um exchanges that exist here so there's saturn and moon in one and seven so saturn is in cancer sign of moon mm -hmm. moon is in uh capricorn sign of uh um saturn so this is uh, what we call uh, a maha parivartna because it involves the exchange of two positive houses the yeah. positive houses are uh one two four five seven nine ten and eleven Mm -hmm. So this is qualifying, one and seven. So uh, when you do this, you can effectively say moon moves, flips over into the first house and Saturn goes into the seventh. So uh, when Saturn does that, it, it achieves its own sign Capricorn, but it also picks up Digbala as well. And so Saturn is kind of the, the greater beneficiary of this, um, of this exchange. Um, what we call the control planet for this part of Vartan Yoga. But in any event, themes of both the first house uh, and the seventh house will emerge hugely in her life. So, you know, Saturn in the first, uh, one of those things for her was, you know, she was not very healthy when she was young. She, uh, while she was at university, she missed like a half a year because yeah. she was seriously ill. Uh, the whole thing about relationships has been a problematic one for her. She had a husband who was an alcoholic uh, womanizer uh, and caused her no end of uh, emotional grief. Uh, the one seven exchange, I mean, it's also good for public performance and being in the public eye, being a spokesperson of one's people, uh, assuming great responsibilities with Saturn in the first, being uh, very attached uh, as a representative of one's people. Uh, diplomacy and uh, on an international level became a, a big deal with her. I mean, she was a proponent of what was later called the, uh, the Indira uh, Doctrine, which was, you know, uh, preserving and um, uh, guarding uh, India's borders. And in the course of her, uh, her rulership, you know, uh, there was a minor war with Pakistan and another one with China, which was, yeah. you know, to erupt into something much larger. So, you know, those are just some of the themes that came out uh, in that particular exchange. Then she also has an exchange between Mars in the second and Sun in the fifth, between the, their respective signs, Leo and uh, um, uh, Scorpio. So uh, again, this is another positive, a Maha Parivarta Yoga, because it involves two positive houses, second and fifth. So themes of family, uh, that's one thing. And Indira Gandhi came from a famous uh, family, you know, Nehru. Uh, and then even her heritage, uh, you know, her sons uh, became well known in politics as well, too. Um, speaking of uh, sons, children, uh, there was some hardship there. And these are major themes as well, too. Even though the exchange uh, facilitates the success of children, there can be problems as well, too. Um, uh, so, you know, one, one son died in a plane accident uh, and another uh, was assassinated. Um, yeah. Even you can look at it in different ways and say the, the, the second house is education. Uh, Mars there is a bit problematic. Mm. Uh, so she had difficulties uh, in her education and she wasn't the best student, mm -hmm. uh, missed uh, certain schooling. Economics was not her forte either. You know, sure. she had three five-year plans and economic problems really dogged her uh, throughout uh, much of her tenure. Yeah. Uh, last but not least, uh, if I have time to cover this, this one is interesting, the exchange between Venus and Jupiter in 6 and 11. So Venus sits on the Rahu Kiku axis, that's an important thing to know, yeah. and exchanges with Jupiter, which is retrograde, therefore bright and strong. So this, this is what we call a um, uh, Danya, uh, Parivartana Yoga. It's problematic because it involves uh, a, a, a Trikishtana. So uh, what it invokes is some of this notion of alternation between friends and enemies. Uh, uh, the 11th is friends, uh, the 6th house is enemies. Mm -hmm. 
And so she uh, experienced severe highs and lows in her political life because what, who were once her allies at one point became her enemies, enemies. who once were her enemies were, became her allies. She was in and out of jail a couple of times. It's almost unheard of to think of today for a modern leader of a country to have this happen to her. And then of course, most famously, you know, the sixth house uh, reflects one's servants or the people that one works for. Mm -hmm. You know, after she allowed for the destruction of a, of a famous Sikh temple, yeah. and the whole Sikh uh, constituency in India became very aroused in anger against her, and what happened is that she was eventually assassinated by her own two bodyguards, her employees, mm -hmm. who were Sikhs. Uh, and this is the sort of thing on the Rahu Ketu axis, it might very well have been a consequence of some karmic injustice from the past that set up this whole sort of uh, um, situation wherein she would have employed uh, Sikhs as bodyguards rather than, you know, uh, some other, um, you know, um, um, people with a different caste or background or whatever. Anyway, so she, that's sort of a quick crash course in, uh, this is an amazing chart because only yeah. one person in 10,000 has three Pari Vartna Yogas. No more are possible because you only have seven planets to work with. So you can only have three exchanges and that's it. But the chart is truly remarkable for that reason. For sure. <laughs> and okay. uh, as you said, it's just a quick crash course in Pari Vartana Yogas. Let me try to unshare that. Uh, uh, if I figure out how to go back to do this, um, uh, where are my controls? You can just uh, click stop sharing on the top. Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Done. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, uh, I think it, it was a very good session to begin with. And we'll probably get back uh, sometime soon with much more, uh, f uh, in terms of discussing much more finer things in your book with uh, more examples. Yeah. I think if you want to purchase this, uh, this one of the, one of the most important books in Vedic astrology, I think uh, you can find it almost everywhere. It's there on Amazon and you, you can find the link on uh, navamsha.com, which is Alan's website. So uh, is, there, is there courses that you teach uh, or you want to talk a little bit about your uh, website so that uh, people can just go and check out? Well, yeah, the, I mean, I do two things. Basically, I, I give consultations, of course, and I do private tutoring for intermediate and advanced students. And as I said, I've stopped writing novels and I'm just writing uh, astrology books. I've written uh, uh, Parivartana Yoga. I, back in November, I published a book on Kala Sarpa Yoga, mm -hmm. which again is a, a subject that no, nothing no, was written about. I mean, because largely it springs from an oral tradition uh, of southern India. Uh, so very little has been written about it. And a lot of people, you know, do not believe in it. Uh, K.N. Rao even wrote a book about it, which is basically against Kala Sarpa Yoga. But I think it's more about disputing, um, you know, it's used by unscrupulous uh, astrologers to scare clients into thinking that they have to get a Puja or Yagya or whatever in order to fix their problems. But anyway, I did a great deal of research. I became fascinated by the subject and spent 18 months uh, researching and writing that book. Um, anyway, that's another one. And then I have a couple of other books of essays, technical articles, and so on and so forth as well, too. Uh, this is my passion these days, basically writing uh, and speaking about astrology because um, um, it's such a fascinating subject, and it's a constant learning experience for me as well, too. And I hope for my readers and uh, and listeners. I've started doing stuff uh, on YouTube myself, That's and this coming year will see me involved in a lot more conferences than before. That's uh, that's great to hear. And to give a final touch, uh, Alan's books are Stellar Astrology, uh, Mutual Reception, Parivartana Yoga, and Kala Sarpa related to astrology i'll share the link uh, in the description page and uh, we'll see you soon thank you so much okay, alan great. for joining thank you so much ashwin